Good evening. Welcome to our Sunday night Bible study at the First Baptist Church of Oneida. My name is Pastor Sean, and I welcome you to this time where we dive into God's Word together. We pray together. We worship together. And uh, I do pray that God has blessed you with a great week. I pray that you are walking in the light as He is light. And um, as we get into God's Word, I want you to grab your Bible and turn to 1 John. We are walking through 1 John, the epistle of John, 1 John, on Sunday nights. And we're going to be looking in chapter 2 this evening. So let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then we will get into our Bible study. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the blessings of life, Lord. Uh, the simple ones, as, uh, such as a hot shower to the, the running water that we have, uh, electricity, just uh, heat and air, all those things, Lord, sometimes we forget. We thank you today uh, that you bless us with those uh, privileges, amenities we might call them, but uh, other people don't have uh, the things that we have. So I pray that we never take for granted, Lord, all the resources that you've blessed us with. Lord, I pray for this uh, time of year as we come into a time where we're going to look at the, the harvest and the fall festivals and then on to Thanksgiving, and then uh, it just seems like time is flying and we'll be celebrating the birth of our Savior soon enough. But Lord, I pray that each one of us each day would stop and reflect just for a little while on how thankful we ought to be and how great it is to live where we live. Lord, help us to grow in our relationship with you, I pray. And I pray that we're faithful to our churches wherever we attend. Lord, I pray that we would support our church and other churches around and just get out and share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Tonight, Lord, we look into a, a, a great set of verses that challenge us, but also remind us, Lord, that we have obligations as Christians. And there are certain tests that we need to pass uh, when it comes to knowing whether or not we are genuine Christians, genuinely saved, because we will act like we are genuinely saved. So as you uh, meet with us here tonight, guide our study, Lord, and help us to see what's in this biblical text and try to digest what John is trying to say. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we are in 1 John chapter 2, and I actually covered this verse 1 a little bit last week, but this is such a, a big theological word that we're going to encounter in 1 John chapter 2. When John says, my little children, these things I write to you that you may not sin, and if anyone sins, we have an advocate, and that's a big word, and that means someone who comes alongside us and represents us, uh, helps us. Uh, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And, and then 1 John 2, 2, the Bible says, and he is the propitiation. Some of your translations is going to say expiation. And scholars, that you know, kind of debate on uh, are we splitting hairs here for this word, halasmos. But I really believe that propitiation is a more robust, that means a more fuller word or definition for the atoning work of Jesus Christ. Now, last week, I believe I mentioned the substitutionary the uh, theory of atonement. I would go one word even more than that, the penal substitutionary theory of the atonement. Uh, sometime in your spare time, look that up, penal substitutionary theory of atonement, and see what you find, because I really believe that it explains and it is the best view. Now, there are numerous theories of atonement, uh, and, some, and, and sometimes you'll run into uh, some, <clears throat> like the, say the ransom theory or, or others, but you'll run into them, and they will have um, elements of truth in them, but the most well-rounded or robust theory of atonement is, in my opinion, penal substitutionary theory of atonement, and the Bible says Jesus himself is the propitiation all right, so that's such a, like I said, a big word. We need to understand that at Calvary, God's righteous wrath was absorbed, you might say, or diverted by Jesus. Jesus took, and that's what Isaiah meant when he talked about that suffering servant, that, that he took our guilt and our shame and our place. And so as we think about this world where we're talking about this is fair and this is not fair, this is just and this is not just, 
I, I, when I look at what Jesus did and what we tend to say as American Christians about fairness, this was not at all fair, uh, but it was the Father's plan, all right? In the end, it was the Father's plan. So Jesus is the propitiation for our sins. He <clears throat> took on our guilt, our shame. He absorbed, he diverted, he took on the very wrath of God for our sins. Our sins and iniquity was laid upon him, and by his stripes, you and I are healed, okay? So understand, Jesus is the, the payment uh, for <clears throat> our sin. And the Bible says, he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Now listen. We do not teach universalism in Southern Baptist life. Not everybody's going to be saved, okay? That's all, you know, some people could try to twist that to say that Jesus paid for the sins of the whole world and everybody that, you know, everybody's going to be saved. Well, that's not so. Only those who have placed their faith and trust in Jesus Christ shall be saved, all right? Those who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So this doesn't teach universalism. So I want you to remember it like this. The atoning work of Jesus Christ was effectual or efficacious for the sins of the whole world. Okay? All right? There is an unlimited scope in that sense. All right? But it is only limited to those who place their faith and trust in him. And my prayer tonight is as we talk about such a important such an important subject that you know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. Perhaps somebody's out there tonight listening or watching and they're asking a question akin to the Philippian jailer. What must I do to be saved? And I would tell you tonight that you ha have to come to a, uh, the conclusion, the conclusion that you are a sinner in need of a Savior. I think a, a big problem with our society is, with lost people is, they don't, they don't see a, a reason or a need to be saved. But when I read the Old Testament and the New Testament, and when somebody shared the gospel with me, I came to the conclusion that I was a sinner and I was in need of a Savior, okay? And I admitted my sins, I believed in Jesus Christ, and I confessed Him as Lord. So a big hurdle for many of us when we are evangelizing, when we are soul winning, is we're dealing with people that are thinking, well, what do I need to be saved from? Why, you know, I'm, I'm good. Life is grand. Uh, but we know as Christians that it is appointed for all men and women to die once, then comes the judgment. This life is not all that there is. So if you don't have Jesus, you don't have anything. And I would say that if you have Jesus, you have everything you need to fight the good fight and run the race in this life. Now, <clears throat> authenticity and genuineness are two other words that are very important in the Christian life. And as I have studied culture, and whether we're talking about boomers, busters, millennials, Gen Xers, whatever uh, demographic you want to talk about, I realize, especially in the younger generations, that genuineness is a big, big sticking point when it comes to organizations and whether or not people want to be a part of something. I would submit to you this evening that the, the lost world and curious people and those who are searching uh, for meaning of life, they want to see that we are genuine in our Christianity. Now, hypocrisy has exemplified churches all over the world for too long, all right? We need to be genuine in our love. And we're going to look at a couple tests here in just a few quick verses that remind us that this is how you can know if you are of the faith, all right? Now, John's going to talk about some people who went out from them, or, or us, he says. They went out from us, but they weren't really of us because if they were really of us, they would have continued with us, all right? So we might call that perseverance of the saints. Um, but there's some tests here in 1 John chapter 2. We're going to look at them. And if you're wavering or wondering about your salvation, maybe this is a good lit litmus test for you to look at tonight and to say, hey, hmm, how can I know that I really do know Jesus, all right? And we're going to look through a couple verses, and we're going to find out. Now look with me at 1 John chapter 2, beginning at verse 3. 
Now by this, we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. Now see, right off the bat here, John is giving us a, 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 a litmus test, okay? If we say that we love God, then we are going to strive to keep his commandments. Now let me make something very crystal clear, I hope, to everyone who's reading First John, okay? John's not going to say that we're going to be perfect, okay? Because remember back in chapter 1, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us, all right? So what, what I think the big idea hinges on here in First John is, is it's not that we're not going to, you know, achieve sinless perfection. We're not going to be perfect. However, the true Christian is going to strive to keep God's commandments, all right? See, there's a big difference in somebody that just says, well, I know the commandments, big deal, whatever. No, that ought not to be us. That's not genuine Christianity. Genuine Christianity is, okay, Lord, I need your help. I'm going to strive to keep your commandments. Lord, I fall and I fail and I sin sometimes, but I'm going to go back to 1 John 1, 9 and confess my sin. And if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So when you read 1 John, don't think that he means sinless perfection. His children are going to sin. You and I are going to sin. But there's a difference in the believer because the believer does not want to sin. All right? The believer does not want to sin. However, sometimes the flesh is weak. Sometimes, just like I mentioned last week, Galatians 6.1, if anyone is overtaken in a trespass, ye who are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Sometimes believers sin. So we don't need to... I don't think beat up on one another, beat up on ourselves, but when the Holy Spirit convicts us, the true believer is going to feel conviction, and we're going to be uneasy, and we're not going to be able to, to continue in our sin. That is the, the kicker, I think, with a saved person and a lost person. A saved person will feel the chastisement rod. They will be keenly aware that the Holy Spirit is, is convicting them and he is doing his work. So it's, this doesn't mean that uh, we can't break any of the commandments because we will. But what John is saying is a habitual lifestyle of obedience is what we ought to strive for. We will sin, we will fail, but God's grace is greater than all our sin. That might be him 329 in the 1991 Baptist hymnal, I'm not sure, but I think it is. Grace that is greater than all our sin. Now, we don't trample on that grace. We don't just use it as a license to sin, remember? Let's keep this in balance, all right? But the reality is we are going to sin. But the pattern of our lifestyles ought to be such that you and I strive for holiness. In my Sunday sermon last week, I talked about how we are uh, guaranteed this heavenly inheritance that's incorruptible, undefiled, and fadeth not away. But then as you go down in that passage in 1 Peter chapter 1, Peter talks about girding up the loins of your mind. He talks about being sober, all right? And so we have this obligation to strive for holiness. We have this obligation to represent Christ well. So now this, by this, we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. Now, as I said, our habits or our lifestyle ought to be so that we read God's word, we heed God's word, and we allow his word to speak to us. We don't make excuses, and we surely don't say like I have said before, I know what the Bible says, but have you ever done that? I've done that. I've said that before in a, a moment of anger and just thought, well, you know, I know I need to keep my big mouth shut, or I didn't need to react like that or I shouldn't let my temper get the best of me. We have those times in our life, beloved, when we don't think and when we don't react as if we ought to. And simply what we need to do is ask for forgiveness. And we need to mean it when we ask, all right? 
So one of the ways that I know that you and I are genuine Christians is if we strive to keep the Lord's commandments. We don't turn a deaf ear and a blind eye to them, and we don't apply them only when it's convenient for us. No, whatever the book says is what the book says. And it doesn't matter what my commentary is or your commentary is. God's word is the final authority for us as believers. The Bible says, but whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this, we know that we are in him. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. All right. So here is the second thing that I want to mention to you. If we're doing these tests, I would say the first test is our attitude. Saved persons, I believe, according to Paul as well, will have a certain kind of attitude, specifically one of obedience. We want to obey Jesus Christ and his commandments. Now, secondly, it's attitudes, but then I think this is just as important. It's our actions, just like we saw in verse 6. Saved people want not only their attitudes, but also their actions to please the Lord. So our actions, as verse 6 says, he who says he abides in him ought himself also walk as Jesus walked. Our actions ought to be like Jesus's actions. And so on Wednesday nights, if you're watching, I'm preaching through the Gospel of Mark. And I came across uh, a little saying uh, several years ago that, I have, that I've kept in my mind when it comes to Jesus and asking, well, what, you know, what do you mean, preacher? Well, what, what did Jesus do? All right. If we are to walk like Jesus walked and, and, and emulate Jesus, well, what, just what did he do? And in the Gospel of Mark, I have been sharing with our church, Jesus went around preaching, teaching, and healing. All right. Now, I don't think that I have the gift of healing, and I don't think you have the gift of healing. Uh, many people will argue over the, the gifts, uh, spiritual gifts, and did they, uh, uh, are, the, are you a secessionist, or do you believe that they ceased in the apostolic age, or uh, do you not believe that? You know, that's an argument for another day. I'm not going to say that God can't do anything, because I know that he can, but I don't have the gift of healing. But there are some things that I can do that Jesus did. And so I use the phrase, I pray <clears throat> that as you and I try to emulate Jesus, that we would see what Jesus saw, feel what Jesus felt, and maybe not healing, but loving or meeting needs, do what Jesus did, all right? Whether it's ministering to the woman at the well, whether it's going out and, and uh uh, providing encouragement or, uh, you know, meeting people where they're at is one of the things that Jesus did so many times in the New Testament. And that's something that you and I can do. Jesus wasn't judgmental. He didn't seem to be harsh, but he seemed to be loving and caring. So that heart that Jesus had, that minist uh, ministerial servant type attitude that Jesus had, you and I, if we are saying that we're Christians and we're authentic, all right, and we are striving to keep his commandments, I think naturally we will want to do what Jesus did. We will want to conduct ourselves as Jesus. Now, this says, walk as he walked. Uh, and, and, you know, that's, that's metaphorically speaking for his life. How did Jesus live his life? And we know that Jesus met people where they were at, and he loved people, and he had compassion for them. And oh to God that more Christians would get off of their high horse and have compassion and love and not be so judgmental. Now, many of us uh, lived a, let's just say, a rambunctious lifestyle before we got saved. And all we should have to do is go back and think how we were uh, walking around in outer darkness, how we were grasping for things and trying to hold on to things that kept letting us go. Those of you all like me that knew how miserable it was to be lost in our sins and trying to find ultimate satisfaction in the things of this world, that's all I have to do is reflect back on how bad of a sinner and how lost I was and how amazing Jesus' grace is. Who am I to look down on anybody else? Who am I to look down on anybody else? Two great phrases that I remember regarding the way Jesus lived is has to do with how you and I conduct ourselves. The only time we should look down on somebody 
is if we are admiring their shoes. Huh, you ever heard that? And then the only time we should put somebody down is on a prayer list. We have no gavel. We are not a judge. We are not holier than anybody else when it comes to the grand scheme of things. We are but one beggar telling other beggars where they can find bread. All right? So I don't care if you're the pope. I don't care if you're the president of a convention or an association or the president or whoever you are. We all put our britches on one pant leg at a time, and we're all equal. And according to the Bible, God shows no partiality. So we strive to keep his commandments. That's a mark of a believer. And we strive to walk like Jesus walked. That's verse 6. Now look at verse 7. Verse 7 says this, Brethren, I write no new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you have had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you heard from the beginning. Again, a new commandment I write to you, which this thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. Now, here's verse 9. All right, now listen to verse 9. Here's another one of those tests. He who says he is in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. He who loves his brother abides or stays or dwells in the light, and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he's going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Here is yet another way that you and I know what the true marks of a believer is, is that one who says he's in the light and he hates his brother is in darkness until now. Don't tell me that you love God if you don't love your brother or your sister. Now, there are so many different directions you could go with this, but I'm going to tell you what really uh, affects me and, and, and makes me scratch my head and it's, it's, a, it's a phrase that we've come to know in American culture called can, uh, cancel culture. And you've heard that term, I'm sure. We want to cancel everything, all right? From history to, I mean, just it just seems people, uh, the statues, uh, you know, I can go on and on. I just don't understand how a Christian could advocate for cancel culture when, when all we need to do is look back on the sin debt that was canceled for us. You understand? We have been forgiven much, so we are to forgive much. And in a society that just wants to do away with certain things and cancel them out altogether, where is the forgiveness in that? All right? Now, I want you to see the principle is this. Don't tell me that you, you know, I'm going to say it a different way. I'm going to say, if you say you love God, then you ought to love your neighbor. But there is so much hatred going on in our world today. People just, you know, that's what they do. When you hate somebody, and you, don't, you want to cancel them. Cancel them out. And it's sad that our nation is not known for its love, but it's known for division. And uh, this culture that we live in now is just making me scratch my head. Now, if, in case you didn't know, I mean, I'm, a, I'm an 80s kid. I grew up in, you know, my teenage years and graduated high school in 93, but I grew up on that 80s stuff and uh, born in 1975. And I just look at how culture has changed over the years. And some, some of you out there that are older than me, you know, probably marvel even more because you've seen radical changes in your 60, 70, 80 years on this earth. I mean, it's just been radical, and we, we just scratch our heads. But we have this challenge to remain ambassadors for the Lord, and our challenge is to keep the commandments. Our challenge is to walk as Jesus walked. Our challenge is to love our brothers and our sisters. And who is my brother and sister? Everybody. Not just your, your neighborhood or your biological family. Doesn't matter what color they are. Doesn't matter what socioeconomic class they're in. When you ask that question, who is my neighbor or who is my brother? The answer ought to be everybody is. Everybody is. 
And so, you know, I, I kind of think about some of these songs I hear on the radio. And I don't have nothing against uh, the Zach Brown band. I like Zach Brown. But he's got a song that, that says, we're all in the same boat. And every time I hear that song, I'm thinking, no, we're not. We're in the same storm, but we're not in the same boat. Because people have uh, certain, uh, they have certain, uh, what would I, what, what's the word I'm looking for? They are set up in life so that they don't have to deal with and suffer like some. Some are privileged. Some have it made. Some are not struggling, all right? We're not, we're not equal is what I'm trying to say, all right? So we might be in the same storm, but we're not in the same boat by any stretch of the imagination. And, and my prayer is, is that we understand knowing the commandments and keeping them, all right? Doing what Jesus did and trying to live like he did. And then loving our brother and, and loving our sisters. That's, that's three things that would be on our radar screens as Christians and that we would do them. Because, you know, as much as we like to talk about the American dream or move, come to America because you can do whatever your heart desires. There's a lot of injustice and unfairness in America, just like anywhere else. And it's not... Um, easy to live sometimes and my prayer is is that we christians would love one another and the world the world out there would know us by our love not by our fancy <clears throat> establishments not by the steeple or the parking lot because we know that's not the church the physical building uh the steeple that they associate or even a cross that's outside that's not the church. The church is people. Born again, blood-bought people. And I pray that people would know our church by our people. Amen? That they would know, hey, that's fine that you associate with me with First Baptist Church of Oneida, but, but that building down there on Main Street, that's not the church. The church is the people. The church is us. So let me challenge us to think about this tonight when we're talking about genuine Christianity. The benchmarks of a believer, you might say. Litmus test to let me know I'm a believer. I strive to keep the commandments. I walk as Jesus walked. And if you don't know him, then you don't know how Jesus walked. You better read your New Testament, all right? All right? And I'll break that down into A, B, and C. Love like Jesus loved. Uh, see what Jesus saw, do what Jesus did, and here's D, uh, feel what Jesus felt. And then lastly, love your brother, and I'm going to say, and your sister. All right? So how do I know if I'm saved? Here we go again, just quickly. Number one, I strive to keep the commandments. Number two, I walk as Jesus walked. I strive to do that. And number three, I love my brother or sister, and that means everybody. We ought to be known by our love. So my prayer is, as we walk through 1 John, and remember, 1 John 5, 13, we have a very distinct, specific statement for these things I write, all right? 1 John 5, 13, these things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Now, remember that. We have blessed assurance tonight. Now, I'm going to pray for us, and I want you to ask yourself, do I strive to keep the commandments? Do I strive to walk as Jesus walked? And do I strive to love my brother or sister no matter who it may be? Period. That's our challenge for this evening. Let me pray for us as we think about these truths. Father, sometimes it's hard to want to keep your commandments when it, they might contradict the way we want to respond or act. We know, Lord, that we are to be full of the fruits of the Spirit. And I pray that we think about love and joy and peace, long-suffering and gentleness and kindness. I pray, Father, that we think before we speak and that we love everybody that we come in contact with. God, help us to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I really believe that that's the secret, that if we would be so filled with the Spirit that we would be able 
to fight off these wiles of the devil, these, uh, the trickery of the devil, because he wants to trip us up. He wants to divide, devour, and discourage us. Lord, I pray that we would strive to keep your commandments, and that not only that, but we would see what you saw, feel what you felt, and do what you did. Meet people where they're at and love on people. And lastly, Lord, uh, I pray that we would not hate our brother or sister, but that we would show them love and care and compassion. And everyone is my neighbor. And that our church wouldn't be like the looking Levite or the passing priest in the parable of the Good Samaritan. No, we don't want to be gawkers and lookers, but we want to be doers. It reminds us of James 1. Help us to be doers of the word and not just hearers only. God, I pray that you help us in our walk because we are weak and thou art strong. Heavenly Father, keep us from all wrong. Thank you, Jesus, for saving us. Thank you for commissioning us. Now help us, Lord, to fight the good fight, to run the race, to press on as we try to be the best ambassadors for you that we can possibly be. I ask this prayer tonight in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you. I pray that you have a great week in the Lord. May his face shine upon you. May his grace be poured out on you. And may you represent him well as you live in our community. Take care.